Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I'm honored to be speaking to the current leader of the Opportunities Party, Shine Avot. How are you doing? Hi, good. Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking the time out to do this because I know your schedule must be crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Two full-time jobs is busy, but it's good. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll start with the obvious one, which is housing, which is the big thing at the moment, right? Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts with the current thing that the government has done are you for that are you against it are you somewhere in the middle (laughs) where do you sit with it where does the top party sit with it like all government policy decisions we need to look at what the consequences are of those decisions because sometimes we hear headlines and some people might initially say oh that sounds great or that sounds terrible but all that actually matters are what the outcomes of those policy decisions are So, for example, let's take the extension of their bright line for a start, right? They've changed that from five years to 10 years, excluding unoccupied properties. Now, that is in defiance of Treasury, who said, go for 20 if you're going to do this. Mm. And, you know, whether or not people want to characterise it as a a capital gains tax or not is irrelevant. Um, We do not expect it to have any impact that policy on house prices at all. If we want to characterise it as a capital gains tax that excludes the family home, we are excluding two out of three properties. We are excluding a huge percentage of the value of the market. So it in of itself is not going to be a, a solution to this madness. Then we can look at the um, changing the tax deductibility rules. Now, that one's a big one because of the consequences. And I, you know, I noticed online there were a lot of people who were like, yes, let's go and get those landlords because they've been scoring renters for too long. (laughs) And I can absolutely understand that, right? Because renters have been struggling harder each and every year. Rents have been rising faster than incomes for 30 years. Um, Tenants feel it. I'm I'm a tenant. I get it. You know, I mean, the instability aside, I've lived in, I think, five houses in the last four years. Wow. You know, I, I get it. And uh, renting in this country is a huge, huge disadvantage, and it just shouldn't be. So I understand that feeling of like, yes, let's, you know, get those landlords. Um, but unfortunately, the consequence of that policy decision is that rents will rise. Yeah, And that to us is the consequence that needs to be evaluated. And that's very concerning because again, as I just said, renters have already been struggling harder and now we're just going to punish them more. So it sounds as though it's a short-sighted policy decision. And the focus of that was to focus on first home buyers. But what that seems to forget is that first home buyers are renters. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> on the one hand you want to help them because you've decided that home ownership is your priority as a government and on the other hand you are disadvantaging those same people more it doesn't make a lot of sense um, and we don't it's not a system that we have for other businesses and I know people go oh landlords shouldn't be running businesses anyway the, the fact of the matter is it is treating them differently And the consequence is rents will rise because they will be looking to fill that gap in how much money they were expecting to have each and every year. So rightly or wrongly, you can put your value judgments aside. Renters will suffer as a consequence. Do you think that you should put a rent cap on? There should be a cap on rent? (sighs) Rent caps is definitely something we constantly looking at and reflecting on because it is um, an area where the evidence is in flux and there is you know traditionally and and for a long time it's been the evidence has been fairly clear that rent caps do not overall solve your rental problems Uh, ultimately there are constraints on supply which is the opposite of what we need right particularly in New Zealand where supply is already severely constrained So we have not yet seen evidence that 
supports that that rent caps in and of itself will avoid that supply issue. Now, it's not that they would never work. Certainly, there are situations where you could envision uh, if the supply problems can be solved. Uh, one thing that we've been talking about a lot at top is uh, build to rents and really incentivizing investment in build to rents. And that can be a positive for obviously the supply side, but also you've got these investors looking for places to put their money. And so we would have liked the government to have been talking more about that. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so you go. I was going to say, because there doesn't seem to be a silver bullet. I mean, some people think that there is, but it's a combination of factors, right? That's absolutely right. There is no one thing. And that was something, you know, running, you know, in the election last year, I noticed so much is that across the political parties, often they would focus on just like one or two aspects of the huge problem. And really only top was wanting to target it from all these different directions because you've got supply on the one side and all the related issues. And then you've got demand on the other side that very few parties were willing to even speak about because everybody felt when I say everybody, I'm referring to the main establishment parties, felt that it's more politically palatable to speak about this housing emergency as a supply issue only. And that is absolutely part of the problem. It is a part of many problems. Mm. So considering there's so many issues with this, if you had to focus on just one thing first, which, which of the issues would it be in regards to housing? Would it be the supply issue first? Would it be building supplies, not having enough workers? If I could change one thing tomorrow, it would be changing the distortion in our tax system that tells Kiwis, if you've got cash, put it in housing. Right. It is a huge distortion in demand that has been in place and has created this huge rise in house prices for decades. And very few people are willing to talk about that. Mm. Because the supply issue is not something that can be fixed overnight. The supply issue is something that needs huge change. You know, going back to the government's announcements, one thing that was a positive was their funding for infrastructure. Granted, it was a drop in the bucket of what is needed, but it was a good step, right? Because a huge handbrake on supply are issues around councils not having enough money to invest in the infrastructure that's needed for new development. And so getting funding to that is certainly a good step, but our supply problem is going to take years to catch up. Whereas if we can fix demand and focus on that, we can at least make, that's a quick change. We could do, the government could do overnight. <laughs> Of course, they're never going to do that because they have ruled out even the idea that house prices should stabilise, let alone their need to drop. Yeah. So in regards to infrastructure, because we've underinvested in this for decades, it seems. But the, problem, but the problem is every time you invest into something and you allocate money and resources to it, you're taking away from something else. So how do you decide how you get the balance right and what takes highest priority? Yeah, that's a question when it comes to any government expenditure, right? And a few things I'd say to that, you know, one, as taxpayers, we want to make sure that we are getting the best value for every dollar that we're spending. And for too long, um, independent advice has sort of been ebbed away so different politicians come along and they'd like to use that money for their pet project because they've promised this bridge or this politicians come along and they've promised that road so they'd like some money whether or not taxpayers and the public are getting best value for money out of those investments has sort of been ebbed away what we would like to see is bringing back in an infrastructure commission to oversee all infrastructure spending, to make sure it genuinely is going on the right projects in the right place. And so that in and of itself would get us further along the way to help that decision-making be more effective and in the public's genuine best interest and not because this or that politician is trying to buy people's votes. Mm. I also think public transport, for example, kind of ties into housing because, you know, if you have a massive apartment complex, for example, and it's next to uh, a rail track, for example, 
then it's easy commute into the city. You get rid of cars. Uh, people can get places easier. Uh, increase in productivity, for example. But we seem Absolutely. to... Absolutely. That yeah. is a huge part of our policy is exactly that, building densely around active and public transport networks for exactly those reasons. Yeah, because... Um, Not to mention reducing climate change emissions. Uh, sorry, carbon emissions. You know, that's <laughs> another huge part of it. Yeah, because the Hamilton to Auckland train just launched, which seems like an epic fail to me. Um, I haven't used it yet, but it seems doomed to fail because it doesn't really help uh you know it's not it's not fast it takes a long time to get there, yeah. right it's a diesel train as well mm-hmm. i mean it's and it and i know what the government will say is it's the chicken and the egg scenario where well we need patronage before we'll invest in it but people don't want to use it unless it's very effective or it's actually, it actually uh makes it easier for them in their daily commute right so wouldn't, wouldn't it be That's better right, to just but, invest in it straight away from the get-go, like just invest the $40 billion or whatever it is to build a whole new rail line? That's it. And the chicken and the egg argument, I don't know that I buy. We have an example to look at, which is the Northern Express uh, bus service, which I think uh, is our probably most effective public transport service in Auckland. I am biased because I, I have used it a lot, but I, I I think it's incredibly reliable. And that was the opposite. That was a put a great service in place, people will come. And that is what happened. People did start using it because it was an, and is an excellent service. So, yeah, to, to suggest that the opposite is necessary, just here's a good example that proves otherwise. Mm, mm. And, and it seems like things are being delayed. I mean, I don't know how long this light rail discussion has been going on, right? It just keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And by the time the infrastructure is built, it's already too late. And it's it, you need to upgrade it again, which seems this to be the it. story of Auckland constantly. This right? is the story of Auckland and of New Zealand's life. We have always been decades behind in our planning. And I think personally, a huge part of this is a feature of our democracy, which is this really short term governance and short term thinking. Very rarely are governments prepared to step forward and say, right, we might not need this particular piece of public infrastructure right today, but in 10 years, in 20 years, we will need this and we will, we will invest now. That is what we've needed, that type of really far future reaching policy thinking, policy design is how you get effective cities and effective towns, but we just have not had that. And now we're seeing the consequences. I do think our democracy has a lot to answer for in that regard. Do you think it's it's still quite difficult though because of say the way Auckland's designed, right? It was never designed as a city that's built up uh, it was just built out, and so it makes it even harder to retrofit the infrastructure needed, as opposed to, say, a city like Wellington, which was built up somewhat the CBD, uh, but that was mostly because you couldn't build anywhere because of the hills. But um, even then, you've still got problems because it, it sprawl just keeps happening. For some reason, uh, overseas, people seem to build up, or countries build up, but here we don't. That's right. We have for so long had sprawl over density Mm. for many reasons, which we probably don't have time to get into. I mean, mindset is one, you know, the Kiwi idea back in, you know, before our time, even the quarter acre section was the Kiwi dream. And Mm. so that has a lot to answer for. And of course, NIMBYs play a huge role against density in their suburb, in their neighbourhood. Um, despite everybody knowing we need more housing. And all that we've seen is the sprawl has gone further and further away from the city, from the centre. Pe- that means people are travelling further and further just to get to and from work every day, increasing emissions. And the quality of life has gone down because they're spending so much time every day travelling in traffic. That is all planned. And so, yes, on the one hand, you're right, our city hasn't been designed for density, but that was a decision. That This is the result of deliberate policy decision and policy design. We could have 10, 20, 30 years ago said, no more sprawl, we're not going to continue to do that. Let's, within our city limit, build up. Mm. But 
but that isn't what's happened. And so, yes, the RMA has played a role in that. Uh, it's done a great job to protect our green areas and rural areas, but it has constrained density in our in our city limits. And that is where we should have different planning rules to make it a lot easier to have density, to reduce nimbyism. Hmm. So let's take Auckland as an example. If if you could redesign public transport within Auckland, right? Like mm. what would what would be your way of doing it? Oh, well, look, we don't have a public transport policy, so I can't exactly say we're going to build this bus or that bus well, no. because, again, <laughs> that's, that's you know, <laughs> the type of politicking that we rally against. But clearly we do need to have a coherent public transport system that is efficient, that links the West. You know, I mentioned before the Northern Expressway, which is amazing. Why does West Auckland not have that same bus service along the motorway, for example. Mm. It's it's shocking. They went and built it. They spent billion, oh, I can't remember the price tag, but a huge amount of money upgrading the Northwestern motorway. Huge. It only just finished really last year without all the cones and the meats. And yet we still don't have that efficient, beautiful bus service that the North Shore get to enjoy. So that, that's just an example of doing everything is in bits. Everything is in a silo. They went and were focused, right, here we're going to spend money on the road. But they didn't think wider. Well, what can this road offer? How can we tie this development into improving public transport? No, they focus purely on the road and road users. It's a mentality as well. You know, we have for so long had decision makers who just want to improve uh, traffic for road users. And, and, you know, we hear it as well. Just take, for example, the uproar that on Oniwa Road, because they're putting traffic cameras along there to enforce the T3 along that road, and the uproar about that, people are, you know, very annoyed and think it's an overkill. Now, whether or not that's an overkill is aside. It's the mentality that that tells you because it's road users complaining. What that has actually done, I used to live on Oniwa Road and, and take the bus into town every day, and it was incredible, the fact that we could have buses every three to five minutes and just fly along that T3, fly past all the cars, was wonderful. And yet that that sort of has annoyed the car users, but the point is the more obstruction you place on people and their cars and the easier you make public transport, the switch is just going to start happen, happening naturally. Yeah. Do you think the New Zealand uh, Transport Authority and Kiwi Rail are somewhat of a roadblock? I don't know enough about the internal structures to know whether it's them, whether it's how they are funded, uh, or whether it's, you know, higher up in government directing where those, you know, um, spends of national significance should be. Mm. I wanted to ask in regards to the election because – it seems every year, how I view it is democracy is supposed to be fair and impartial, but the media kind of ensure that it isn't because not every party gets the same amount of media attention, right? So Absolutely. it all goes to national and labor and then all the other parties get the little breadcrumbs. Uh, so have you guys thought about how you'll tackle this cycle, this election cycle, trying to get out there? when TV NZ and media works control so much of who gets to hear the narrative and what the narrative is actually. Yeah. Absolutely right. The media play gatekeepers to democracy, which yeah. is a role they were never given. We've never allowed, we've never said as people, yeah, let's let the media decide how we should vote. Um, it's, it's a huge problem. And there's a lot of parts to it. One, I think the Electoral Commission should take some responsibility here, actually. And they are, it is meant to be a gatekeeper of our democracy. And if it is determined, if it is decided certain parties meet the criteria to be registered political parties, then it should be for the Electoral Commission to ensure that they are having a fair go and that they are having that we do have free and fair elections where voters can hear multiple perspectives from a bunch of different political parties. And as you say, not just think, oh, I must decide between Labour and National because that's what it's always been. 
And, you know, we have twice as a society voted for MMP and yet the media is still playing catch up, that it's not just about two parties here. So it's a huge, it, yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. And it was one of the biggest hurdles for TOP last year, getting our voice out there and constantly getting pushed back from the media, whether it's because they had fears, oh, if we talk about TOP, then we're going to have to give other minor parties a voice. Well, yes, you will, because this is a democracy. <laughs> and it so be. it's exactly what it should be. Now, whether I personally agree with those other voices, whether you do, is irrelevant. We have decided as a society we want to be in a functioning democracy where everyone should be entitled to representation, where every vote should count. And yeah. yet we've created this very restrictive system of democracy. And it is no surprise then that the only new political parties that have made it into government sorry, into Parliament since MMP, have been breakaways from pre-existing parties. Yeah, when TOP gets true. into Parliament, so when we get into Parliament in 2023, <laughs> we will be the first party to do so without any pre-existing ties, without any previous MPs, assuming we don't get any, which we might, open to that. Yep. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the sad indictment on the system that we've chosen. Because I'll be honest, I voted for you guys, oh, but I know, I, I, but I know a lot of people that wanted to vote for you, but they saw polls that said you were polling low, so they're like, "Oh, this is a wasted vote," and so they didn't vote for you primarily because of that. I mean, I don't think this. I don't even know yeah. how those poll numbers work. I don't think they're really valid because they survey a small group of people. Uh, so, how do you? try and reach people and convince them that it's not a wasted vote? We always say voting for what you believe in, voting for policies that you want to see is never a wasted vote. Voting for, you, you know, you're not backing a winning horse. You don't get extra kudos because you picked the party that was going to win. You only get change if you vote for it. And so this idea that it's a wasted vote, because, you know, I, I heard, had that a lot. I cannot tell you the amount of people that reached out to me after the election saying, shy, really loved top, love top's policies, but didn't think you'd get in, so didn't vote for you. I cannot tell you how many times I heard that, right? But um, here's the thing. To, to all those people, what are you getting with your vote by picking a team that's already been there and has done nothing? What do you get with that vote? Do you feel satisfied? Because I previously, before top, I was a swing voter, voted National and Labour probably pretty evenly, right? I was under this false illusion that one would fix the problems of the other and they needed to vote for the other because whatever reason at the time. And finally realised they the outcomes under both are the same. And I could continue to pick one team or their mates and have no change or take a stand and actually say, you know, my vote matters so much and I'm going to give it to those guys because this is how you change things. Yeah, because there's there's two types of voters, I find. There's, there's voters that actually vote on what they believe in and then there's what I'd call strategic voters that vote Based, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that voted for Labour, for example, just because they didn't, uh, they wanted them to have a majority, so they didn't work with the Greens, for example. <laughs> yeah, and and if I'm being perfectly honest, I think National and Labour are pretty similar. You know, mm. they're, they're oh, the outcomes that, under both have been the same. Yeah. If anything, to be fair, actually, I have to say, the statistics show that housing has been getting worse and has gotten worse under both Labour nine-year Labours, but. Otherwise, the outcomes are the same. Yeah. So it's it's frustrating for me because I look at this stuff and, um, I mean, I don't even like the debating system as well. Did you guys even – I can't remember. I don't think you were even in the debates, were you? No, Top was excluded from the televised debates because of TVNZ and the other stations at – very arbitrary criteria, criteria that they make by themselves that the Electoral Commission takes no role in overseeing. Really? 
So what was the what was the reasons why uh, you were admitted? So you the- had to be polling at three percent, or you needed to you need to have an MP or, or a former MP, sorry, um, in there. Is that the rules? Who decides those? That's stupid. I would have to assume producers at the uh, stations. Because I watched the debate, for example, and I thought this Mm -hmm. is a relic of an ancient time with an hour-long show with all these adverts. You give them 30 seconds to answer a question, which you cannot do. Like, how do you answer housing in 30 seconds, for example? And then gotcha questions like, what do you feel about Donald Trump, which has no relevance to anything in New Zealand? Like, I think it would be better, even if you did a Zoom with all the leaders all debating via Zoom and having a mediator. I actually think that would be much more effective. Oh, I would be more than open to that. You you nailed it on the head when you said that you cannot address housing in 30 seconds. You absolutely cannot. You cannot nail it in five minutes. And at the end of each of those sessions, particularly the ones between Labour and National, you know, you walk away at the end of each one, I just thought, was that it? Was that genuinely the best New Zealand can offer? Hmm. Because... We didn't hear any solutions, and unsurprising, here we are with with ones that are probably not going to produce the outcomes that we need. What is New Zealand? What is the New Zealand voter getting out of this conversation but to decide which personality they prefer? But for that, you weren't getting in-depth policy analysis. You weren't even hearing what the outcomes of any of the proposals ever were going to be, never once. Yeah. What were you having the opportunity? What, you know, because I think a lot of Kiwis tune into that, genuinely wanting to be be open minded, genuinely wanting to be convinced, and hearing these ideas and then assessing them. But you're not getting enough information to be able to make those assessments. So you're forced to what do people choose on? Who did I like better, or who do I trust more? And it's not that those points are irrelevant, because of course it does matter that you trust your leaders. That's fundamentally important. But trusting them is not enough to get the outcomes that we need. Yeah, because it seems more as if it's a popularity contest and absolutely. the policies are kind of secondary to that. And that's the number one That's absolutely one thing. it. That's it. If you have, I mean, that's another thing, you know, why we struggled with media attention last year, I think. You know, our leader was an economist and arguably more qualified than many of the other uh, political leaders of other political parties to be in parliament, but wasn't a known celebrity, right? So wasn't a household name. And that is a challenge for the media when they have a... um, charlatan leading another political party who is a conspiracy theorist and causing a lot of harm to the community but because that's going to bring in a lot of clickbaits they will get probably the same if not more airtime than a genuinely reasonable political party Mm. so uh, that brings me back to so how are you going to (laughs) break through that Yeah. yeah are you going to get some celebrity on board (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well applications are open if anyone yeah. is listening no um well they are i guess technically uh we haven't look we haven't filled the next the permanent leader who's going to come in yet um yeah. we are looking at you know considering different options for that yeah look it, it would be naive to say getting a celebrity in would have no impact it certainly would in many ways um, the awareness being one and media's willingness to talk about you another. So, yeah, personality sadly does have an impact and you have to be a realist about that to accept that that is a factor and something we're very mindful of. Um, you know, there are a few other things. We went into 2020 having really only relaunched at the end of 2019. And so we didn't leave a lot of time for our bless them, our marketing team, to really um, run the top brand long enough in advance of the election. So we're not going to um, put ourselves in that situation again. We're not, there's no hiatus like there was at the end of 2017. And we are here. We are not going anywhere. And so we just want to keep pushing on and um, build the awareness, build our brand name over the next few years and just keep pushing and not try and do that in an election year. Yeah. Now, obviously, I have to ask you about UBI because this is a pretty fundamental policy. 
<laughs> and uh, it seems like something that's quite hard to explain to the average Joe, because even I struggle to fully get my head around this mm-hmm. uh, in terms of giving people, what is it, $250 a week, right? Yeah. So where does the money come from exactly? Can you explain yeah. that to me? Yeah, for sure. Maybe I'll reel back a little bit from that and then come back into the money point. So okay. um, one of my, pers- I mean, I could talk about UBI all day long. I, it's <laughs> one of my favorite policy solutions that exist. Um, one of the reasons I love it so much is because it's probably about as apolitical a policy can get. There are very different reasons why people who are typically politically right like it and people who are typically left like it. Uh, it does many things. And it depends on what your priorities are, depends on what you focus on with this policy. So, yeah, for, for top, a UBI means $250 a week cash in hand without any conditions to everyone, to every adult. And so it does a number of things. One of them is that it addresses the huge welfare trap in our current system. So we have abatement rates or the government clawback for beneficiaries when they start to work. Uh, There's a point in time if they're working between five and 20 hours a week, it's just gone up a little bit. So they have just made some tweaks tweaks to the abatement rates. But for previous years, it's been between five and 20 hours a week. You only work with the clawback for between two and four dollars an hour. Two and four dollars an hour. And I don't think there are many Kiwis out there who think that's reasonable. What the UBI achieves in that example is that it just completely gets rid of that callback. So that two hundred and fifty dollars is a floor. It's not a ceiling; it's a floor. It means that it doesn't matter if you work five hours, fifteen hours, twenty hours, thirty hours. That two fifty doesn't get ebbed away by government callback. It just fills that gap. It's a bridge, I guess, between across that welfare trap. And that is a huge one for us. That's It is outrageous to me that we have what's called a welfare system, in quotes, that literally punishes you financially. And that example I said before of the 5 to 20 years, that best case scenario, if you're someone who has accommodation supplement or child uh, working for families, things, sometimes the effective marginal, the effective marginal tax rate punishes you. It can be 100%. So you can be literally worse off when you are working. What welfare system punishes people as they are trying to get ahead in life? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. So that is a huge thing that the, the UBI seeks to address is this welfare trap. Let's just get it out of our system, out of our society completely. And there are other features about the UBI as well. You know, we... We are living in a modern world. We are living in an age where artificial intelligence and automation is coming for jobs all around the world in a big way. Yeah. And we've seen it in very tiny things over the years. You know, the ATMs getting rid of tellers and um, automatic checkouts at, at supermarkets. And just small little inklings of what's coming in the future. So we're going to have less jobs than people. And we need to start thinking ahead, what are we going to do? Because unemployment rates will inevitably rise in that modern world. So we need to think very differently about how we're going to ensure people have an income. Then we look, so so then we look at, um, for me personally, I think, one of the things that is spoken least about with the UBI, but I think it is probably the most important thing for me that I found from a UBI, looking across at trials around the world, in the um, outcomes from the Finnish trial, which um, was a two-year study in Finland of 2,000 people getting a UBI. The results at the end when they asked about anxiety and depression, in the UBI group, those rates of depression dropped by a third mm. compared to the control group, a third. That is a huge proportion. And it's probably shouldn't be surprising considering money. We already know money plays a huge role when it comes to anxiety and stress and depression in people's lives. Mm. And so we don't talk about that part of UBI enough, but we, we want to look after people and we are being shown evidence that this is a way you can do it. 
Um, why would we not? So, yeah, moving along to how do we fund it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, and there's a number of ways in our model that we suggest we could fund it. So um, our UBI came, comes with a flat tax, and I get that people's instant reaction when you hear flat tax is to flinch. But let me tell you that when you pair a UBI with a flat tax, you have a far more progressive tax system than our current one, which means that with this model, we create a $39,000 tax-free threshold. Because before that point, the benefits of the UBI outweigh any change in the tax. And the benefits are really stacked at that bottom end. Particularly, the working poor are the huge winners in this model. And the benefits reduce as your income increases. So... That is a so that is a part of how we pay how we fund the UBI. Um, there is about a billion dollars in savings from our very expensive, very slow bureaucratic welfare system. So you get huge savings from that as well. Uh, and then we also there's a there's a number of ways you can fund the last part of this. There's about eight billion dollars here. So in our, in our modelling, we suggest paying that $8 billion through our property tax system. But that hasn't even factored in what we call dynamic benefits. So these are just based on looking at trials overseas, what benefits have we seen coming out of those? So for example, if you are going into training, if you are electing, okay, I now have this extra bit of financial flexibility, I can now afford to put myself into training, you're going to go into a higher paying job, so you're going to be paying more tax. Um, right. So just as an example, um, you're like, then we take a wider social look and we're going to say, well, right, um, poverty will go down, crime will go down. Um, we have seen, for example, there was a Canadian um, example and hospitalisation rates dropped by 8.5%. So we would expect to see um, savings in our health sector. So these are a bunch of dynamic factors and we don't factor that in into how we would cost it because we, it's an unknown, but we definitely expect that there would be huge savings in there. Right. So why would you give wealthy people $250 a week. They don't really need it. That's the only part that I don't quite understand. It's cheaper. That, How is I it mean, cheaper? That, that's a huge part of it because once you have, I mean, that, that, that's a simplistic answer. <laughs> um, as I said, we, with the savings and bureaucracy and any bureaucracy, any conditioning is expensive because you have to have people in there checking what is the income threshold. Let's say it's $150,000. Okay, you have to have people checking what are people earning. Should they be getting it or should they not? That, that's expensive. Oh, right. You, okay. You any, any system that has conditionality has that risk. You would then also have to get to a point where you could have really inconsistent outcomes where – depending on where your cutoff is, if someone is truly better off or worse off. Um, also, it doesn't make sense because, as I said before, it's paired with a flat tax of 33%. So with our modelling, everyone is still better off. It's just that the, the benefits are stacked at the lower end, like I mentioned. And to have a simple modern system like that, you can't have conditionality and you can't add in this and that condition because it's just going to slow it all down and, and put some added complexity into it, which is what we're trying to avoid. Would you abolish the minimum wage then if you had UBI? We haven't ever said we would abolish minimum wage. No, okay. no, we wouldn't. We certainly, though, see a UBI as avoiding a lot of the problems in these arguments that we have around raising or lowering the minimum wage that the left and the right battle against each other for. And something I spoke about recently, because of course on the 1st of April, minimum wage rose, right? Mm. And there's quite a lot to unpack with the conversation around minimum wage rising and, and, and the living wage for that matter. The biggest driver of the living wage and the need to increase minimum wage every year is the cost of housing, the living costs. Now, our businesses are not responsible for our housing crisis. 
So it doesn't make sense then to burden them with paying for our housing crisis when they didn't create that. So instead, we're saying, of course, everyone needs to have more money to be able to live. We know this, but let's do it through a UBI instead of through businesses. So you've said that UBI will lower crime. Is that part of the reason why I haven't really seen much of like your crime policy? Because you think the two are interlinked somewhat? Uh, no, not really, because I... I that's, as I said, it's a dynamic factor. There's not enough evidence to see how it would, it, it's an expectation. There's not enough evidence for us to say that would for sure happen and here's by how much. It's, a, it's an expectation because we know that a huge amount of poverty, uh, sorry, a huge amount of crime is driven by poverty. But also, we also know housing is the number one driver of poverty and inequality in New Zealand. So our crime policy, you know, people, I, I don't know if anyone's listening would know, but I was a prosecutor. And so I worked in the justice system for years. And I've seen what it's like when you're at the, and when you're the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, you are not changing anything. The, own, the single best justice policy we could have is policy that reduces poverty. And that stops housing policy, that stops UBI policy. Right. Okay. I'm keen for your personal view on this, top aside, mm -hmm. okay? Because okay. this is this is a, an example of something that happened, that I saw happen two, two days ago, right? So I was standing at Countdown. My partner was buying some wine. This lady walks out with all this food, right? And the Countdown staff try to stop her. And she just leaves. I mean, I couldn't do anything. They're legally are not allowed to do anything. So the only thing I could do was take her number plate. Now, I know in bars and clubs, you can actually detain people who are causing problems, right? But it's not really the same in retail. I mean, the amount of people that I know in retail who report stuff getting stolen all the time because people can just walk out and there's no repercussions for them at all, pretty much. Now, as a prosecutor... Yeah. I don't want to be system. giving legal advice, but there are ways for civilian arrests. Civilian arrests is a thing, yeah. How come many people don't know about it then? Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to be in a situation where you need to do it, but well, it, it does exist in law. Yeah. And like there are ways in which you can, um, there are certain circumstances in which you can do so. Okay, because let's say, for example, I see someone stealing something and I try and rip the bag from them, for example. I could get in trouble from the police, which is the weird part. But would you? Well, you know sometimes... What I mean? I, That's the well, question. Well, and look, I'd I can't like speak to. for police and I can't speak for that specific example, but in this hypothetical world, um, it's, it's difficult to see that, you know, holding someone's bag is going to get you in trouble, but I... It would come down to the, the situation and exactly the force used and reasonableness, And security camera footage as well, I suppose, yes. For sure, for sure. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> because you understand this, I mean, because this, this type of behaviour is probably a product of something else, right? Where the, it, poverty this is or... It. This is it. Like when we're talking about theft and burglary and even, you know, violence really, we're talking about societal factors that have driven these people into these situations. We are oftentimes not talking about bad people. We're talking about people in these awful situations. And this is the hand that life has given them. And for whatever reason, they get themselves into the situation where to them, it makes most sense that they need to go and steal a trolley full of groceries to feed their family because our systems have monumentally failed them. Mm. And I, as a former prosecutor, am not sitting here saying we don't then prosecute you because, of course, the law must apply all the time and we need to let justice be carried out and then it's a matter for the judge to decide whether or not, um, you know, charges are appropriate or whether or not um, what the sentencing should be. So I, I do see them as very different, <laughs> different points. You know, there's understanding and having empathy for, I guess, how people have gotten into a situation. And then separately, we have an independent, objective criminal justice system that needs to operate at all times. Well, and yeah. so they sometimes do live in these different worlds. 
Well, the other problem is as well, if someone goes to uh, jail, prison, that ends up on their record forever. And once they get out, it can actually be very difficult for them to say, get a job or to integrate back into society. Uh, so Absolutely. you have this feedback loop where they probably end up inside. I mean, I don't know the statistics offhand. Well, so. in two years ago, so I don't know what the updated ones are, but I think it was as of 2019, our recidivism rate was about 65% within the first five years of release from prison. 65%? 65%. Now, what level of severity those charges are, I couldn't speak to that. So it could be, for example, super low level charges could form the basis of that statistic. So if someone was breaching a sentence of their release, con uh, sorry, not their sentence, if somebody was breaching their release conditions, for example, um, and got a conviction for that, that would count in that statistic. In the same way that if someone comes out and does something incredibly serious, that would also count in that same statistic. But it was about 65% in the first five years. That is significant. To put that into context, in around 2014, so admittedly a little outdated, um, I think Norway's was high 20s, so around the 27, 28% recidivism rate. Okay. That's very, very high. I didn't realize it was that high. I mean, I knew it was high, but I didn't know it was that high. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I've got you for like another eight minutes, so I'll quickly touch <laughs> on, on health because this is another area where – there's so much underinvestment. I don't think I've ever spoken to a doctor or a nurse that is not stressed out or thinks that it's underfunded. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's your approach in dealing with health or general health, mental health? Because diet plays a huge part, for example, right? A lot of these people who are in low socioeconomic class uh, communities, they're obviously eating a lot of bad food because it's cheaper, right? It's actually quite expensive to eat healthy. It, it is expensive to eat healthy. And, you know, a part of our policy last year was really focused on shifting the, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff in the health system and really trying to focus on prevention and creating a healthier society. Mm. Now, um, it was, it really just targeted a few things. So I'm not going to say he's saying, oh, we had this panacea for everything and it was all wonderful, but focusing really specifically on, on to your point. We do want to address the fact that so many people cannot afford to provide nutritious, healthy foods. It's simply not within their reach, not within their financial means. So there are, of course, many barriers to have, you know, diets and particular foods that any one family consumes, but we should live in a society where finance is not one of the factors that forces families to choose to make sure that their children feel full instead of having nutritious food. Mm. So what Top talked about last year was bringing in a junk food tax um, across the board. How much and would that tax be? We were talking about it in the range of about a billion, and that was a very broad estimate. Okay. With that money, um, because, again, consequences of policy really matter, right? So with that money, we wanted to specifically spend it on dental for the lowest income group. So it worked out to be roughly one in five Kiwis to receive free dental. We also wanted to roll out nationwide. Um, we have them actually in really small pockets, so... Um, fruit and vegetable box schemes but at the moment it's very reliant upon your particular community and if there just happens to be a community organization that has set up these uh, at cost fruit and vegetable boxes but we want to make that assist part of a national strategy to have available to all families and it not just be dependent on where you happen to live so using that money to make sure that you then make fruit and vegetables more affordable Mm. And just really get rid of that middleman of the supermarket when it comes to that healthy, nutritious foods. Could you remove GST from fruits and vegetables? That I mean, look, yeah, I've heard that policy a lot of a lot of times. Uh, there's a few questions that sort of arise with that. That would reduce the cost of the healthy foods, but it does nothing for the cost of a bottle of Coke. It does nothing to the cost of unhealthy chips and other 
um, unhealthy foods. So you want to tip the scales both ways. You want to disincentivize purchasing that unhealthy food by increasing the cost and decrease the cost of the healthy food. So, so the concerns with the GST is that you're just really focusing on one part of the problem. Well, could you implement both though? So you could have GST free on fruits and vegetables and say still have the junk food tax. Well, that, that's, that's part of the idea, I guess, is inbuilt into having these at cost fruit and vegetable boxes available. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose the other part of the problem is, is you've got a duopoly in this country in terms of groceries, two people that control mm-hmm. how much uh, all the fruits exactly. and vegetables are in price, right? So you really need another competitor, actually, that might somewhat help. Yeah, our lack of competition in this country is a common theme across many of our industries, food being one, building materials being another. But yes, you're absolutely right on that. Mm. Well, hey, (laughs) I I know you got to go, so I will wrap up there. (laughs) Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, Uh, no, thank you for having me. It's been a great chat. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gutted I can't talk to you longer, but hey, I know how busy (laughs) you are. So all your social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Are you on TikTok? I got a TikTok and I did two videos and realized I am not young enough or funny enough and never went back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, definitely getting TikTok for top is something we need to think about. Because you should do it. You, you need to go where the people are. <laughs> I definitely recommend it. I had one video go viral and I'd only been on it for a month. It's a lot easier to go viral on there than, say, Facebook and Instagram because the algorithm works very differently. So mm. I do recommend it. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll direct someone to do that. Okay. It won't right. be me. Yeah, someone in marketing. Someone in marketing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. Someone That's the show. Young and cool. Yeah, yeah. That's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And until next time, stay safe. See you later. Thank you.